I am Father Mitchell Packer. I'm a Jesuit priest. I live in Birmingham, Alabama, and work at the Catholic Television Network, Colonel Word Television. And I'm glad to be able to be here today. This feast of the Immaculate Conception is sometimes confused. Some people, especially when we have the reading about <clears throat> the conception of Jesus Christ, and it's not about the conception of Christ, it's about the Blessed Virgin Mary being conceived without sin. And this was something that was very much held in the early church. Our, Understand that there are a lot of folks of Lebanese background. Anybody here from a Lebanese family? I've heard there a lot here. But it was some of the saints who spoke Syriac, which is still the language used in Lebanon at Mass. And St. Ephraim, St. Isaac, Stella, and others, who already had just assumed Mary's without sin. And the same was taught by St. Proclus in Constantinople, St. Augustine in North Africa. But it was never defined by the church. And a certain question came up about it. St. Bernard of Clairvaux was asked a question and he gave an answer that no was that Mary was not conceived without original sin. He was why? Especially for those of you who are students, one of the most important things about getting a good result and a good answer is that you ask a good question first. Dumb questions lead you to dumb answers. That is a basic principle. And when I was a professor and a high school teacher myself, I would answer the questions that my students asked, knowing that that was not what they meant. But it was a way to help them get to a point of what they really were trying to find out and learn to formulate good questions. Somebody had asked St. Bernard of Clairvaux, was the Virgin Mary immaculate before her conception? And he said, of course not. That was a dumb question. Why? Because she did not exist before her conception. The moment of conception is the most important moment of our lives. That is the point when you start to exist, and every one of us starts to exist at that moment. And so to say, well, was she imagined before her conception, the question would be no, because she did not yet exist. And he answered the question as posed, and St. Thomas picked up the question from him, Thomas Aquinas, that is, and it passed on, and the Dominicans had that question too. But Saint, our oh, well, student, Blessed John Duns Scotus, reposed the question: Was Mary immaculate at the moment of her conception? And when you rephrase the question, because she does exist, I said yes. And some of what we see here in the Gospel helps us to understand why he answered that. The angel, not just somebody who's trying to schmooze our lady. Angels tell what, or say what they're told to do. And he says, hail, full of grace. In Greek, hail, kentomen. A literal translation is, hail, one has been graced. That this is this grace that exists within 
before he shows up. And then he says, the Lord is with you. And then in the next section of the gospel, we see something when she goes to Elizabeth and mentions Elizabeth here. And mentions how Elizabeth is already with child in her old age. And she's past the time of giving birth. Clearly something miraculous. So she goes to Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth sees her, the Holy Spirit comes upon Elizabeth and the son inside her womb. He's jumping up and down. The word that they use, Gordidze, means that he was jumping like a lamb. I don't ever see lambs. When they get excited, all four legs come off the ground. That's what he's doing inside. And at the church, all the visitation in Israel at Benkadam, you see the picture of Elizabeth who's bent over. Because the kid is jumping up and down so much. She's an old lady. She's got this baby jumping up and down. And then she says to Our Lady, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Obviously, the opening lines of the Hail Mary. We get it. And with that blessing, that beatitude, blessed are you among women, this is an Aramaic way that they were speaking Aramaic. That was their language. We translated from Greek into English. That was Aramaic. And in Aramaic, they don't have a way to say best or most. It doesn't exist in their language. If I, if I say that this is the best thing versus a better thing versus a good thing, that's fine in English. They don't have that distinction between what's called the comparative and the superlative. It exists in Aramaic or Hebrew or Arabic. They don't have what they do to communicate the idea, they say, you are better than I. They would say, uh, you are good from me. That's their idiom. So uh, when you translate it directly, it sounds very odd, but that's an idiom. So you are good for me. If I want to say, you are the best, the idiom is, you are good among them. So it would be, no, ans tova min kol ha-anashim. Kol ha-anashim. So this is the, the kind of expression saying that Mary is the best of all women. Better than our mother Eve, about whom we read in today's first reading. What makes her better? Eve was created without original sin. It fell into sin. The Blessed Mother is better because she is also conceived without sin and never falls into it. This is where the Saint or Blessed John Duns Scotus had come to understand in the scriptures themselves this teaching of Mary being without sin and that it's appropriate that she's going to bear God the Son inside of her. And the appropriateness of her own sinlessness to carry him is very great. There was a bishop an archbishop who was on television when I was a small boy on a regular basis, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And he had a wonderful way to explain it that I'm originally from Chicago. And I always think of my hometown when he gave this explanation. The importance of Mary being conceived without original sin is that she acts like a lock on a river. In Chicago, where the city is built on Lake Michigan, and the Chicago River goes right through our downtown. 
Now, when they founded Chicago as a trade settlement, and for the first hundred years or so, the Chicago River used to flow into Lake Michigan. Now, this was something that human beings made into a stupidity because the drinking water from the city comes from Lake Michigan. But they use the river for their sewage. And the sewer water used to go directly from the sewers into the river and over into the lake. So much so that when I was growing up, if you fell into the Chicago River, you automatically had to get a tetanus shot. Because there are all sorts of dead things and other nasty things flowing around. And we have a business in Chicago that every so often some concrete boots put people on. <laughs> Rough town. So, what did they do? They dug a canal that went from the Chicago River to another river that was at a lower elevation. And they put that canal at a slight angle going down. And when they were ready to finish up the job, the last area of dirt to, to deal with was right at where the river was and the empty canal. They blew up that last bit of dirt and all of a sudden, the river water started to go down, going flowing down the canal toward that other river. So that at that point, the sewer system of Chicago would go down to Memphis instead of to the Chicago River. As I told you, not a nice city. Pretty town, not a nice city. So you've got. That's how they took care of that. But then, to make sure that the river did not flow back uh, into the lake, they put a lock with gates, two sets of gates. They would fill it with water from the lake so that ships could go into the river without the river water flowing back into the lake and the drinking water. And that box still exists, still works. Our Lady is like that. When you think about the way human history is a history of sin that begins with today's first reading from Genesis. The man and the woman did exactly what God told them not to do. And throughout human history, people do that. They choose to do what God tells them not to do, and it leads to a number of all the facts we see here. First effect, they hide from God. One of the main reasons, it's not the only reason, but it is the majority reason that people claim to be atheists. They are using a theory of atheism to hide from God because their deeds are things that they don't want God to know. And they try to act like He doesn't exist and therefore He won't criticize them, He won't condemn them, so they just hide just like Adam. But sin also has lots of other bad effects. And again, we see through history and in our own times how sins like drunkenness, and drug use lead to other sins of violence and carelessness. Drunk people sometimes drive and kill other people. People who get high on drugs will kill to get drug money. Then they steal. Then this is where one sin leads to another. Our Lady is the lock into that river of human history of sin with violence coming one after another throughout our history. And Christ is like that enormous lake, that infinite lake of grace that flows His grace into the river to clean it. 
matter of fact, so well has the cleaning of the Chicago River gone, people actually, they really did clean it up. And now you can actually swim and fish. There were no fish when I was growing up. Now you can swim and fish in the, in the river on the main. And this is also a nice symbol of what Christ wants to do in our, each of our personal lives as well as in the history of the world. And Our Lady has this key role as that lot that lets in the grace without letting our sinfulness miss mm -hmm. Christ. And this is part of what we celebrate with this grace.